Air is invisible to us, and so are viruses. So to visualize how COVID-19 could spread through air requires the use of computational fluid dynamics, or CFD, to predict, using mathematical equations, how air flows. What we normally do is we study um, airflow around buildings, or around athletes, around uh, runners, around professional cyclists and so on. That is the gap that we try to fill partly with our work, is to see, okay, what if you are a professional athlete, if you go training, maybe cyclists, they go out for five hours, six hours, seven hours per day. You're riding constantly in the slipstream of another person. So you're riding constantly in a droplet cloud. So the situation will be different. And that's also what professional athletes say. They say in, in cycling, there was uh, last week a very nice interview by a top uh, Dutch cyclist who said uh, if on the first day of a multi-stage race one rider has the flu or has a cold, a few days later the whole peloton has this cold. And, and that's actually a bit empirical evidence of, of also we had uh, the research work that we did. Fluids are either liquids or gas, and the way they behave can be mathematically modelled. Essentially, a mesh or grid is applied to the objects or space being simulated. At each intersection of the mesh, called nodal points, equations provide answers to the speed, position, temperature and various other characteristics of air. Simulations are often validated by comparing them to real scenarios that have been set up in a wind tunnel. Our intention was to see what is different when you are moving in terms of movement of droplets around you. And so this social distance, or actually it's a physical distance that has been determined and that is in some countries 1.5 meter, in some it's 2 meter, in some it's 6 feet. That has been determined actually about 20 years ago for two people standing still and talking to each other somewhere where there's no wind. And that makes sense because most of the droplets that you exhale or that you can cover sneeze, they don't travel further than 1.5 meter. And if they do, they will probably land on the ground and, and not on the face of the other person. But when you're moving, things can become very different. When you are moving forward and you're exhaling droplets, the droplets actually are very light. So they will not keep moving along with you. You will actually leave them behind you in your trail. So if other people actually are then walking towards this droplet cloud, they can actually also walk through the droplet cloud. So this means that this uh, social distance that we now know will not be the same, will not be this 1.5 meter or 2 meter, when you include rapid movements. Can you define what a small droplet is? So when people are uh, exhaling, every time you exhale, you also are emitting droplets. And these droplets can be very small. They can even be smaller than a micrometer. Eh? So that's one, one thousandth of a millimeter. And that's also the reason why you can't see them unless you use special lighting. I think the, the power of simulation is that it visualizes often items we can't see, like in this case, the airflow patterns and also the movement of droplets. We wanted to provide an answer to the many people by the dozens actually that have asked us, how when I go cycling or running, how should I overtake another person? Should I hold my breath? Should I walk in a big detour around them? Uh, should I just avoid overtaking? Is it okay when I cross somebody? And that's actually what we determined. And what we actually found is that these droplets remain quite confined in a relatively small area, the slipstream, that is where the airflow is disturbed by the movement. That is actually called the slipstream or the wake. And so it's actually an area behind you with, with lower pressure. And this lower pressure actually also helps in containing the droplets there. So it's fine if you overtake a person, but just avoid what cyclists like me also do all the time. You want to be in the slipstream and there you have less air resistance. Here the message is just the opposite. Just stay out of the slipstream. And then it's perfectly fine to overtake a person. It's perfectly fine to be uh, cycling even when it's a little bit crowded, as long as you stay out of the slipstream. At least don't stay in the slipstream for a long time. It's fine if you go running or cycling two next to each other, there is no problem at all. So all the areas around another person are fine, except the slipstream. There are still a lot of unknowns on possible transmission routes. Variables such as wind direction and speed can also have an impact when outdoors. Other factors such as exposure time and being in an enclosed space also increase the likelihood of transmission. No distancing guidelines are thought to provide complete safety and for those considered high risk, it's recommended to stay home and isolate. Try not to walk behind 
the same person for a very long period of time. Don't remain in the slipstream for very long. And, and that's why actually our work was really geared at athletes and people practicing sports, where you do have that for quite a long time. And we should make it a bit harder for ourselves. Be out of the slipstream, a bit more air resistance, but cleaner air. I also got many comments from people saying, well, we live in a city and it's very crowded here and we cannot keep that distance all the time. But I think that's also not necessarily an issue if you're just walking around. The issue is actually with fast movements, where these droplets are in the slipstream. We're all in this together. Let's be a little bit extra nice to each other. It's not that people are, that are running and cycling are spreading the virus more than others. I think if, if we all give each other a little bit of space, literally and figuratively speaking, uh, I think we're uh, already a, a, a big step forward uh, in this pandemic.